I wake up every day looking forward to the opportunity to learn new ideas and new perspectives, which is why I am so pleased to be working with the sponsor of today's video, Magellan TV. Magellan TV offers documentaries on a wide range of topics and even arranges them into thematic playlists to make learning a topic even easier. History's Verdict is a series exploring some of the significant leaders of the 20th century, including Stalin, the Soviet Union's Man of Steel, the man who solidified the Soviet Union into a global superpower. And if you prefer exploring the natural world instead, Magellan TV has you covered. Check out the Majestic Earth playlist and celebrate the uniqueness and beauty of our planet with hours of documentaries. And the good news is, Magellan TV has even more than that. There are more than 3,000 documentaries waiting for you, and hundreds of them are on the history of various periods from the ancient world all the way to the modern era. New documentaries are added weekly and available on most devices, including phones and PCs. Magellan TV has a kind and exclusive offer for our viewers. Click the link in the description to get a one month free trial and watch hundreds of history documentaries anytime, anywhere. Hi, David. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, today is uh, 143rd day since quote-unquote special military operation started, supposed to be three days, but... Longest three-day special military operation So now? at this point, I don't know why they're still calling this special military. It's a, it's, it's it, war. It's a war. It's a war. So um, what's going on? Um, so we see that Russia is um, kind of creeping from one side and uh, Ukraine is trying to liberate the other side of the country. So from the looks of it, if you look from outside, it may seem that Russia is winning at it at this point. Yes, I think there's a there's I'm not going to say it's a common theme or a common note, but there's definitely a, a voice that's vocal out there that suggests that Russia is winning, considering that there is and has been a significant power imbalance that Russia hasn't overwhelmed everything. Um, in Ukraine where they're folk trying to focus their attention, it may start to paint a bit of a different picture. Um, obviously, like from what you've what you just suggested, Russia seems to be very much focusing its attention on advancing into uh, a pocket um, in Luhansk and Donetsk and trying to secure that territory. Um, they've been using tactics for the last probably six weeks, two months, um, wide-scale artillery barrages, um, plastering everything in front of it and moving forward at very, I mean, very slow, slow speeds forward. Um, not a lot of territory captured, like it's not big, huge territorial gains. It's certainly not the type of war movement that they attempted in the early stages of the war. Um, it's, it's very much a, a slow slog. The terrain um, where they have advanced and have captured is very much more open, flatter territory, which lends itself to the type of tactics that they're using. Um, but the Ukrainians are holding on to a lot of high ground um, and are definitely slowing down any type of Russian advance. And I think this is a very deliberate tactic on the part of the Ukrainians to try to, to slow down. They're taking really heavy losses. Um, but the Ukrainians are, again, they're, they're buying time. They're trying to draw like, the Russian focus and attention into a a slow slog that absorbs resources and men and time and money in that particular region while the Ukrainians are focusing and trying to go onto the offensive in the south. Um, in the, I think it's around uh, moving towards Kherson and they're trying to open up access and ensure access for the, the port of Odessa um, that they can keep that open for the Black Sea access. Uh, the Russian Unilateral withdrawal from Snake Island obviously has a fairly substantial strategic component to it. Um, there's a bit of a, it's not a lot, there's actually, the, it's not a bit, it's an actually a tremendous propaganda value. Um, with Snake Island, the Russians weren't able to hold it as it kept getting absolutely plastered by the Ukrainians. Um, basically anybody who's sitting there has been getting plastered, but at this point the Russians seem to have withdrawn from it and given it up to Ukrainian control which certainly advances the idea that the Ukrainians are going to be able to keep Odessa open. Are the Ukrainians being, are they having a lot of success, certainly like advancing in the south? That I've seen, it doesn't look like it's an overwhelming success. Um, again, it's, it's the, type of, the same type of tactics that need to be used. Um, it's a slow, slogging, crawling fight. Um, 
yeah, they each each side has different strategic objectives, obviously, and they're they're fighting obviously to try to on different fronts. So. Yeah, uh, Mr. Putin, um, who recently compared himself to Peter the Great, and uh, yeah, and uh, he said you know he was restoring the you know all the Russian lands. So I think it's the clear indication to what we mentioned in our first video that it's all about imperialistic mood and imperialistic ambitions. Um, so he said that we haven't started yet. I think I think yeah, it it sounded like this. I, I'm translating from Russian. So do you think Russia? can bring more and more troops to the border and overwhelm the Ukraine like that can make this huge difference if they declare the war to Ukraine. The, the general consensus that I've seen has very much been that the, the Russians have the, the equipment and not the personnel. The Ukrainians have the personnel and don't have the equipment. There's, they seem to be put them together and it's, it's a whole army. But as it stands right now, I think the, the Russians are, I think, and I've said this before, the Russians are suffering from a manpower issue. They have, on paper, they started the war with a 900,000 strong, man strong force. But how much of that was a paper force and how much of that was actually troops that they could put into the field? Given what craft and corruption and things that look like and have evidently been fairly well demonstrated that there's a lot of that that happens within the Russian Federation. Um, I don't believe that there's there was ever 900,000. Uh, the Russians, I think the last estimate that I saw was maybe between 140 to 100 and like 200,000 troops um, that they could, real troops that they could put in the field. They seem to have committed a lot without moving to a general mobilization footage. That's going to be really difficult for them to to increase the, the number of troops that they can put out into the field. Could they move to general mobilization? Yes, they could, but there's definitely a political impact that's gonna happen with that. Uh, it's, it's a conscript army that has a very high percentage of ethnic minorities that compose it. Um, it's a lot of Bashkortostani, it's a lot of Buryatians, that's two of the Tatars. The, the yeah. Tatars that make up the majority of, of the army. They come from poor regions. They're not able to, to avoid conscription, you know, bribery, doctor's notes, whatever that needs to be, to be able to get out of, you know, serving, serving their time. And I think Putin's reluctant to, to start drafting ethnic Russians and calling them up in, in greater numbers because there's, I mean, you see video footage of Moscow and St. Petersburg, and it's people carrying on with their normal lives. The war isn't touching, touching those places because that's not where the people who are dying really, it's not where they come from. If there's a general mobilization, if there's a wider call up, they're going to have to start drafting in ethnic Russians. They're going to start coming from the major population centers. There's a real political impact that's going to happen. Um, this, this won't be a popular war. And it certainly won't be popular for Putin if ethnic Russians start dying in larger numbers. That's the reality of it. It's interesting how you mentioned that Russia has weapons but don't have enough personnel. But we see that all, all those weapons, like most of them are right now burning in the uh, ammo depots because of M142 HIMARSes. Um, when uh, Ukraine got HIMARSes, I think lots of military experts say that that could be the turning point in the war because they can launch the rockets up to 80 kilometers it's controlled they can be so precise that you know hit the certain target so easily we can see this map here where we see that for last uh, two weeks lots of uh, fires in the ammo depot so what's going on there like high is high mars that effective a high mars as a system it, it is that effective um for those who don't know, it's a it's a, a rocket it's a rocket system, long range but precision guided. It's very much incredibly accurate to within feet, um, up to eighty kilometers. And the advantage to it is that because it is incredibly mobile, they can use Western intelligence, target what they want to hit, fire, and immediately have the system start moving again to be able to to avoid any kind of counterfire. Um, the Russians, and I've said this before, the Russians, I think, have a, a growing logistics problem. 
with their routes of advance, there are only, there's a fixed number of logistics entry points uh, that can bring in the sufficient amount of ammunition, sufficient amount of supplies um, that they need to be able to prosecute uh, combat. And it's typically it's along rail lines. Um, and what ends up happening is that there's specific, probably known in advance, places and positions where the where ammo depots and supply depots are going to be set up. And before the introduction of HIMARS, the Ukrainians didn't have any type of artillery, rocket, or tube uh, that could reach far enough to be able to touch those uh, those supply depots. The introduction of HIMARS um, certainly introduces the ability for them to be able to, to hit deep into Russian-held uh, territory and hit those supply depots. What you end up seeing as a result of this and sort of the proof that since the introduction of HIMARS two, two and a half weeks ago, um, is the amount of artillery fire, because this is all mapped, it's, it's, hopefully we can bring up a map of this, but the amount of artillery fire that's being recorded has dropped immensely um, over the last two weeks. And a lot of that artillery fire is Russian fire being being targeted into U into Ukrainian positions. That decrease is a direct result of a lack of ammunition, a lack of supplies, um, which is really what's bogging, helping certainly to bog down any type of Russian advance. When you have a tactic, a strategic tactic, or a tactical um, implementation where you're relying on being able to plaster your opponent and then advance forward, if you don't have the ammunition to do the plastering part, you're not moving forward. So HIMARS and other systems, I think, um, coming in from the UK and I think Norway has agreed to transfer some as well. Um, those types of uh, long range mobile artillery systems are going to be a huge game changer. Uh, Russian tactics seem to have adjusted somewhat where they are, the ammunition that they are expending, some of it obviously is forward onto Ukrainian positions. Um, but as we've seen just in the last week, they're starting to shift back to like rocket, indiscriminate rocket strikes into civilian targets. They're hitting universities, they hit a medical center. They're killing dozens of people with each of these strikes, but they're not hitting military positions. They're going after basically their terror attacks and they've reverted back to that similar to what they were doing in the early parts of the war. These aren't sound military tactics. These are, this. I think this is a, a sign of I'm not going to say Russian desperation, because I don't know how long this type of situation can last. Um, <clears throat> but HIMARS is certainly, I think, having, and systems like that, long-range artillery, are playing an immense role and are going to change the face and the way that this war is being prosecuted, at least in the short term. Uh, Mr. Putin, who we can call at this point the salesman of the year for NATO, um, forced other countries to join the NATO. And if you remember in, the, in, in our first video, we mentioned that I think it's good timing, you know, we can go back and, you know, verify whatever we said back then. It's, it's not about NATO. So we see that uh, Finland and Sweden will be accepted to NATO very soon. Uh, and I don't think Russia is planning to attack those countries. Um, and also there is uh, this issue with the Kaliningrad, the Lithuania doesn't let, you know, all this supply line go through there. How you think Russia will react to, to those countries that's going to join to NATO? I don't think they really can react. Um, at this point, the, I mean, certainly with Sweden and Finland now, they weren't formal members of NATO. Clearly, they've been working very closely with NATO for years and decades, Partnership for Peace. Sweden has been the, the best non-NATO non member and member of NATO that NATO's ever had um, for a very long time. Um, through the Cold War, even um, the Baltic is a is a NATO lake at this point. Kaliningrad is genuinely the only point on on the sea that that is in the Gulf of Finland, I guess, because of Saint Petersburg. But um, it really is like a, a Baltic lake. I don't think there's anything that Russia can do. Russia really has their hands full with the Ukrainians right now even if they wanted to try to put strikes onto Finland or Sweden or Poland, I don't think they have the ability. Um, not a sustainable one. I mean, they could they could land a strike against Lithuania and Latvia. Unfortunately, it would be pretty savage and pretty bloody for any of the Baltic republics, um, but that would likely force the rest of NATO to get involved, um, which is, I, I can't see I can't see 
Russia doing that, um, it also would make them even more clearly the aggressor. I mean, for those who choose, for those who choose to believe the Russian line that the Ukrainians don't exist, or like you know the Ukrainians had it coming for wanting to, you know, how dare an independent country try, try to make independent decisions for itself? I mean, <laughs> how 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 just how dare they? I think if they tried going after Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, even Poland, I think that that's incredibly counterproductive in terms of the, like the, the message that they've been sort of like, that they've been presenting. Um, I can't see it happening. I just I just don't. Uh, and I think that would actually force NATO to really come together even more. The early weeks of the war, and we talked about this, the early weeks of the war definitely saw NATO as the most unified that we've seen it in decades. Um, and then there's been fracturing that's happened sort of within that. I mean, certainly Italy and Germany have sort of done this like weird splintering thing where they promise something and then they don't follow through or they walk it back. Or I mean, Schultz is getting really, really good at that. Um, <clears throat> but if there was a clear attack on a NATO member country, I, I can't see how they would be able to back down from concrete, solid action um, that they would have to take. There's no walking back from unless an agreement from them means absolutely nothing which i don't i don't believe that um so i I really don't see putin the master genius strategist that he is he's actually can be a smart guy in his own way um he's playing his own game but i can't see him doing that i can't see him going after nato we see in europe that some countries some some head of the countries resigned like uh, Boris Johnson resigned recently, we saw it. I don't think it's accepted yet, but Prime Minister of um, Italy resigned, I think. Um, and uh, there's some things going on in Estonia, like it's real hard to follow all the news. So, and uh, when we had the election in the United States in uh, 2016, we said that, you know, like it may be in- infiltrated by Russian hackers and stuff like that. Do you think Russia is somehow infiltrating all this political crisis in Europe or it's just a coincidence? I know that, you know, the war may impact some of those decisions, but do you think Mr. Putin is behind? Me personally? Yeah, I think that there's, I think there's, there's Kremlin, there's Kremlin money, certainly, whether it's directly Kremlin money coming out of Kremlin coffers directly too, or whether it's through the, the power, whatnot exerted through the oligarchs. Um, there's there's a lot of Russian money that's been that's floating around out there, that seems to end up in certain places where consistently where it, you would think that if there wasn't influence that it shouldn't be, London Londonograd as it sometimes gets derisively known. Um, there's definitely a lot of Russian money that's floating around in UK politics. Is it floating in the in U, in the US? Is it, is it was there? Was there a covert Kremlin operation to, you know, to seal the election for Trump? <laughs> you guys make your comments. I'm sure there'll be lots of that in the comment section and everything. I, I think that there's a lot of Russian money out there. There's certainly a lot, like, in the UK. Um, that's turning into a bit of a focus in terms of, you know, now that, Ron, now that Boris Johnson has decided to resign, he actually hasn't resigned yet. He's still the PM. Uh, but they're going through with like the, the Tory leadership race. I think there's been some decisions made in terms of who was going to run and who wasn't going to run uh, based on connections to Russian money. Um, one of the things that Johnson is himself under investigation for is meeting with a former a former KGB operative and a, certainly like a senior member, like an you know, advisor within the Putin, like, you know, within the Putin regime. Um, and he met with him alone in 2018, I think it was, and didn't record any of the details of that. Maybe it was innocuous, maybe it wasn't. It's certainly suspicious. Um, with, it's interesting that you mentioned Johnson. Though. Johnson stepping down is probably, is, I mean, as the joke goes, I think that's probably the Ukraine's biggest nightmare. Because every time Boris Johnson put his foot in it, which was fairly often, he'd take a nice little trip to Kiev and you know make a promise of X amount of, you know, X amount of gear and weapons and dollars. Boris Johnson's gaffes was uh, Ukraine and Sol- um, Ukraine's like biggest win, like almost every time. So it's gonna, it'll be interesting to see how things change. Um, but this is 
This isn't a short war. This isn't a, this isn't a, this isn't going to be over anytime soon. This is going to keep going and drag out and keep going. You know, making sure that the support goes where it needs to go is important. Okay. Thank you, David. So let's see um, what happens. Hope, we hope that, you know, this horrible war will end soon and we won't discuss this anymore. But if it continues, we'll come back and uh, see what's happening there. Thank you for your time. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.